absolutely loves nature and animals. Absolutely. Well, there you go. They've yeah. got a walled garden up there. That's a bearing press. <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed you've yeah, got a yeah. bearing press. Yeah, yeah, You've got a yeah, press yeah, anyway. Yeah, I'm assuming you're using yeah, it for, yeah, for yeah, putting bearings in. Uh, well, I actually use it for all sorts of things. A few examples. I actually press. Okay. After just plain steel, you know, you know cut. Um, I cut the round shape. So that that looks like combustion chamber. Combustion chamber. chamber yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Not if during construction because the yeah. vaporizers are still yet to yeah, be. Yeah. It's a wind chime. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a very, yes, yes. very detailed <laughs> wind chime. <laughs> <laughs> you design and make fully functional miniature or small jet engines. So, what's your background, James? What made you um, decide that you wanted to? and make your own tiny jet engine. Jet engine. Well, it actually dates back many, many years, uh, back to when I was in my early teens. Um, I was quite an enthusiastic mo uh, model aircraft uh, follower, and uh, one of the things I loved the most was helicopters. Uh, and in those days, helicopters had to be powered by an internal combustion engine, a little glow engine. Uh, and I could never understand the necessity of having this little piston engine uh, thrashing its heart out inside the model helicopter, making everything vibrate. Uh, when I was watching full-sized helicopters flying around, clearly with a uh, jet engine powering the rotor so smoothly and calmly, and it just seemed a sensible way to go to try and emulate that by making my own little jet engine, um, which I started doing actually in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. It really? was actually when I tried to start. Uh, the biggest problem I had, uh, which is exactly the same problem that uh, Whittle had uh, on his engines, was getting access to the right materials. Um, also, I was somewhat lacking a decent workshop as well, <laughs> <laughs> which is how I've come to actually create the workshop here, is uh, through uh, the need. Yeah. Approximately how many pounds of thrust do you get out of one of these engines? Uh, it will vary according to its actual rotor size. Yeah. Uh, but an engine, the examples we've got here on the bench, Typically will be about 16 pounds or about 7 kilograms of 7 thrust. kilograms, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. they weigh about half a kilogram, yeah. you know, about 1 pound. That's like holding yeah. 7 bags of sugar in your hands, isn't it? Exactly. So that's yes, quite it, a substantial amount of force. It really. is indeed. Yeah. It, will, yeah, yeah. it will lift a, a good size aeroplane off the ground. Yeah, uh, I do. I'm in the process of building <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. May I pick this very carefully? <laughs> pick this up and this feels like it's made out of balsa. Balsa and ply. Yeah, so look at that bad boy there. And just, yeah, so uh, the jet engine actually sits, tucks under uh, here right. and blasts all the hot gases out the back. That's amazing. amazing. So that little engine will fly that aeroplane. <laughs> That's fantastic. You make these things by hand. Yes, absolutely. How does it work? What happens? All we're doing with any jet engine is essentially Sucking air at the front end, yeah. compressing it, yeah. heating it up in a combustion chamber where the amount of air expands dramatically. Uh, as an example, an engine like this would be about five cubic feet of air per second coming in the front end cold, and it becomes approximately uh, 15 cubic feet of hot air by the time it's been heated up. That then goes through the turbine and the purpose of the turbine is to extract some of that energy from the gas to drive the compressor. So in actual fact, actually what comes out of the back end is only about 10 cubic feet of mass flow uh, of air. Because 5 cubic feet have actually been converted, the, the heat that has turned that uh, 5 cubic feet into 15 cubic feet back down to 10 cubic feet is because of the temperature changes during the engine. And a jet engine fundamentally is all about temperature. 
Okay. Yeah? Okay. So all we're doing is changing so, energy by temperature. So on the front of here then there's an electric motor. A little starter. Which yep. spins rotor up. the rotor up. Yeah. Okay. Then I, I believe you might inject some gas in there yep. to, to warm up the, the engine. The engine. There are yeah. actually two ways of doing it. I typically use the gas. It's the simplest uh, solution. So we just put a little bit of gas, ignite it with a glow plug. There's enough energy in the glow plug to ignite propane. Um, and that will then heat the vaporizer tubes. Okay. Because our primary fuel is kerosene uh, or paraffin, whichever way you like to call it. And that will not vaporize at ambient temperature. Okay. So what we have to do is just heat up those sticks. So when we pour it in, it will vaporize and turn to a gas yeah. fairly much instantly. Yeah. So the, the gas is only on for a matter of 30 seconds to a minute. There's enough time to heat up those tubes. Once the fuel starts going in and starts burning, instantly that's giving the heat. So the gas can then be turned off and the engine will then accelerate on the heat from that kerosene. So at which point the engine then becomes yeah. self... Yeah, self-sustaining. Self -sustaining. What, yeah. what, yeah. what we're trying to do is achieve... Uh, a, a point where we don't need the starter motor any longer. Absolutely. The starter motor is yeah. just there to get it up to speed so where there's enough energy. Question coming. then, does, does the starter motor then disconnect? This starter motor, surprisingly, this is a little brushed motor. Yeah. Uh, and it has a Bendix drive on it. Okay. Uh, okay. Which basically, as the starter motor kicks over, throws the Bendix forward, connects to the rotor, and spins it up mm -hmm. and when we're ready to disconnect we actually essentially short circuit the motor which Just acts like a brake, brake. Yeah. Okay. which instantly grabs the Bendix back off the rotor okay. and, and away the, it goes. And then it disconnects, it's okay. disconnects. and then, and then yeah. Yeah. everything's just going on. We rely on the energy from the turbine to drive the compressor and essentially a jet engine becomes more efficient, more powerful the greater the heat that you can put into the turbine. However, what the turbine is made of determines how hot, hot it can, get. can actually get. And so there is this uh, balancing act between having a material that will withstand the heat that you want to put through and actually restricting the heat to that material. Uh, and when I started, it was really just uh, the only thing I could get my hands on was mild steel, yeah. which doesn't last long at all at elevated temperature. Moved on to stainless steel, which will last a little longer. Uh, you might be able to get one engine run out of a stainless steel wheel. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the 1990s when it was starting to become possible to obtain small quantities of uh, a material called Inconel, which is a very high nickel alloy, uh, which will maintain its strength at very very elevated temperatures and in fact it's the same material that they use in full-size jet engines uh, because it, of its capability to put up with the high temperature and the extreme stress of uh, centrifugal forces with these rotors rotating around at very very high speed. So the, the, the speed of the rotor is up to uh, 160,000 RPM? The example RPM, here was, was 160,000 yeah. RPM. Yeah. The example here um, is 120,000 okay. RPM. So okay. let's say a very modest okay. speed by comparison. And I suppose the bigger the turbine and, and the, the further out those blades go, the more intense the pressure, the central fugal mm -hmm. forces on the tips of those blades. On those tips. And you mentioned earlier that it was up to two tonnes in tons. some cases. Yes, so that's quite incredible. The turbine wheel is essentially a cast disc. So what we have in the back end of all of these engines is a, a blisk or a bladed disc. So this has been cast in Inconel which we were speaking about earlier, very high temperature, um, but maintaining the strength. So this particular one is same rotor size as we've got down here. This would rotate at uh, 160,000 RPM. Now you can see the size of these blades here. 
they're tiny. They are tiny. They're, they're the size of your little fingernail. Yeah, yeah, mm. and they will be weighing somewhere around two to three grams. Yeah. If you just snap one off, which, okay, which we won't. No. <laughs> But when this is rotating at 160,000 RPM, the centrifugal force on that blade, trying to take itself out of that rotor, is approximately two tons. That's incredible. So there's approximately two tons of stress at the root of every single blade there. And an incredible amount of he exhaust, exhaust heat, heat. Yep. pushing past it. Yep. So you've got actually coming into this, so at the front of the blade, the temperature is approximately 850 degrees centigrade. <laughs> That's pretty hot. <laughs> That's pretty hot. But interestingly, even though it's, we're, we're talking probably about eight millimeter different distance there from front to back, the back end uh, is generally gases coming out at nearer to 600 to 650 degrees centigrade. Okay, understood. So we're actually losing nearly 200 degrees in that distance. In, in about five millimetres. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that yeah. is actually what is giving us yeah. the energy to spin this to drive the compressor. And this, the compressor on these engines, uh, at this kind of size, you're looking at approximately 20 brake horsepower. <laughs> 20 brake horsepower. Some motorbikes don't even have 20 brake horsepower. horsepower. <laughs> so did you get this cast yourself? Uh, yes, we, as a group, um, which we've mentioned before, were the Gas Turbine Builders Association. So well worth, uh, by the way, just a quick interjection yeah. there, well worth checking out their website, the Gas Turbine Builders Association. Yeah. Please pop on and... Um, and go and have a go look at their web look. website. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you get these cast then? Yeah, we have these cast uh, because Inconel is a particularly difficult material. Um, it has to be what is called virgin cast. Okay. So all the elements that make up the material are actually mixed during its liquid stage. And it's then poured into uh, the mold and it can't be poured strictly into the mould because it's actually, once it, it's melted, it's more or less a putty-like material. Yeah. So it's quite gooey. Okay. And so it actually has to be vacuum formed. So, so you've got to suck it into the mould. Essentially mold. suck it in. Yeah, okay. And you also need the vacuum environment to prevent the lighter elements of the metals burning off before yeah. it's set. Yeah, okay. So you need actually so you quite like an, an, an inert sort of environment, environment for, yeah. and a vacuum as well as well so you don't get any yeah okay and no yeah. inclusion so you don't have yeah. any bubbles or anything yeah. inside yeah, no it. voids in it no yeah. voids yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the, the material comes yeah once it, it sort of sets hard um, for safety we then also have them x-rayed so you can actually see if there's any issues with the wheel before you wind it up to these kinds of speeds because when they do come to pieces it can be quite it, spectacular. It can be fairly <laughs> spectacular. Um, so what we do, so that what we generally do, even though we're a, a group of amateur engineers, uh, things like this we have cast professionally. Right. Right. So it's an aerospace company yeah. who has the, all the facilities uh, to do this kind of uh, casting for us. But what that means is it's not very easy to obtain them because. Sure. So this is the heart of, 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 of the kit then, isn't it? Yeah, really? this is so, the heart. Right, yeah. uh, but what we're trying to do now is actually move away from specially cast components because it is a restriction for easy entry into the hobby. Uh, and so what we're now doing is actually using a turbocharger. Already we use the compressor. Yes. From the turbo, from the turbo yeah. So we're now actually moving towards having a, a radial inflow turbine in place of the axial flow turbine uh, because it's made of exactly the same material. It puts up with exactly the same temperature range and the same speeds. Many, many people don't realise that under the bonnet of their car, they have essentially a rotor exactly like that, uh, but with a radial inflow turbine on the back rotating at those same speeds, 120, 160,000 RPM. Compressing air into, your, into, into your... the piston engine. 
into your engine, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're finding is that by switching over to the radial inflow turbine, we suddenly open up the possibilities dramatically because these have to be specially designed, specially molded, yeah. and then cast. So there's a very limited range that we can do in axial flow. But as soon as we move to the radial inflow, like the compressors, millions have been spent in research and development by the turbocharger companies, and the range available is enormous. And so we can actually design then a jet engine exactly to our own requirements and just select the right wheels. Okay. So that makes life a lot easier. Then um, it's a case of making the combustor and the body and the casing fit the wheels that, fit that, those that, wheels. that are exactly. the right size and shape. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. So, so did, have you designed all of this yourself from scratch? Or, uh, or, or many of them I have. This particular engine is called the KJ66, which was actually designed by a, a German uh, engineer called Kurt Schreckling. Okay. Uh, and the K is actually Kurt. Yeah. The J is Jesus Artes, who is uh, an engineer from, from Spain, and this was a joint venture between the two of them. Um, but primarily, it, it was a, Kurt uh, probably did the bulk of the design uh, with, with additional input from, from Jesus. Uh, from there, I've actually gone on to design my own engines. Um, I now uh, have designed a range called the GTBA engines, which is the Gas Turbine Builders Association, all based upon the radial inflow and centrifugal compressor design. So the two most critical components are available off the shelf. Commercially. Anywhere in the world, you pretty don't, much. You don't have to have get anything one of these. specially cast. Yeah, yeah. Every time I take this from you, you look nervous. <laughs> I won't drop it, I promise. <laughs>